It is a great pleasure to have uh, Perla Susi here today from the University of Cambridge, and she's going to talk about phase transition for the late points of random walk. Uh, Perla, thanks for accepting the invitation, and hopefully it will be in person <laughs> next time, and the floor is yours. Yeah. Uh, so thanks a lot uh, for the invitation to speak here today. So I'm going to talk about uh, joint work with Alexi Prevot and Pierre-Francois Rodriguez, uh, where um, we proved the phase transition for the late points of random walk. So first, I'm going to uh, introduce some notation and give a little bit of background about the problem. Then I will state our main result. And in the second part of the talk, I will give some of the ideas behind the proofs. So uh, for my talk, X is going to be always a, sim <clears throat> a single random walk on the discrete torus, Zn to the D. And D is going to be greater than or equal to three. So we are in a locally transient torus. And I'm going to assume that uh, we start the walk according to the uniform distribution. Now, standard notation for every vertex x of the torus, we denote by tau x the first hitting time of uh, the point x. So um, let me clarify that in my talk, uh, all the processes will always be running in discrete time. So the time t here is uh, an integer. So tau x is the first time t greater than or equal to 0 that x t is equal to x. And I'm also going to look at the uncovered set at time t. So I will denote it by u of t. And this is defined as the set of points x in the torus, which have not been visited by the walk uh, by time t. So tau x is strictly greater than t. Uh, so the correlation structure of the set u of t was first studied in the physics literature by Bloom, Elwi, and Hillhorst. And they asserted that uh, the uncovered set U of T is statistically uniformly distributed at large distances. So what do they mean by that? Is that if you take two points X and Y, so that X minus Y is large, they are far apart, then the probability that both points are uncovered at time T, so the probability that tau X is greater than T and tau Y is greater than T, is uh, asymptotic uh, is asymptotically equal to the product of the two probabilities, and this is when uh, the size of the torus n and the time t tend to infinity at a certain rate. Okay, so uh, last piece of notation on this slide. So again, tau x is the first hitting time of x, and u of t is the uncovered set at time t. And um, tau cov is going to denote uh, the cover time which is the first time that the random walk has visited every vertex of the torus at least once. In other words, is the maximum over all vertices of the torus of the hitting time of x, tau x. <clears throat> so this is uh, the cover time. And um, from now on, I will always be using the expectation of the cover time, which I will be denoting by t -cove. So t -cove is the expectation of the cover time. So if I say cover time, I will always mean uh, the expectation of the cover time. And uh, today I'm going to focus on uh, the structure of the set, uh, the uncovered set at times which are multiples of the cover time, of the expected cover time. And the multiples alpha are going to be uh, in the open interval zero one. And the points of uh, U of alpha t cov, we call them alpha late points. And so in my talk today, I'm going to focus on the structure of the whole set uh, U of alpha t cov, and not just, I'm not going to talk only about finite dimensional distributions uh, like I explained on the previous slide. So, I said here that I'm going to be interested in the structure of the uncovered set when alpha is strictly between zero and one. So let me first say now what happens when alpha is strictly greater than one. So uh, this is not uh, super interesting because with high probability, so when I say with high probability, I mean that the probability that uh, the uncovered set at time alpha decov is equal to the empty set converges to one as the size of the torus goes to infinity. 
Um, so when alpha is strictly greater than one, I'm going to explain to you why the M cover set is empty with high probability. So there is nothing to study. So the proof is very simple. Um, using uh, the following concentration result of David Aldous. So what Aldous proved is that the cover time divided by each expectation converges to one in probability as the size of the torus and goes to infinity. So this is true when the dimension is greater than or equal to three. And uh, he proved it actually more generally for any, uh, for any graph which satisfies that if you take for every x and y, and you look at the expected time to go from x to y, and then you maximize over all points x and y, this is what is called the maximum heating time of the graph. So what Aldous proved is that if the maximum heating time of the graph is of smaller order than the cover time, then the cover time is concentrated around its expectation. Okay, so here uh, we need this for the torus. So the cover time is concentrated. So now how can we complete the proof? So the probability that the uncover set is non-empty is equal to the probability that the cover time has not happened by time alpha t code. And now because alpha is strictly greater than one, this probability converges to zero as n goes to infinity. So um, that's the proof in the case alpha greater than one. Now, uh, let me talk about the case alpha equal to one. So this was studied in a paper by, a, so actually it's in the PhD thesis of Alan Prata, who, whose supervisor was Roberto Oliveira at IMPA. So they proved the following theorem. So if you have ZX, an IID Bernoulli family, with uh, marginals, Zx being Bernoulli with parameter n to the minus d. So we assign to every vertex of the torus an independent Bernoulli variable with parameter n to the minus d. And now we consider the set of points V which have Zx equal to one. So we throw IID Bernoulli's, uh, we assign IID Bernoulli's to the vertex of the torus and then we only keep the vertices which have uh, z equal to one. Now, what Oliver and Prata showed is that one can couple the uncover set at time t cold, so for alpha equal to one, and the Bernoulli set v, so that they agree uh, with probability converging to one as n goes to infinity. So under this coupling, the probability that u of t cov is equal to the iid set uh, goes to one as n goes to infinity. Uh, equivalently, one can uh, write that the total variation distance between the laws of the uncover set at time t cold and of the Bernoulli set, of the IID Bernoulli set, the total variation distance converges to zero as n goes to infinity. And let me recall the definition of total variation distance, which is uh, between two probability measures mu and nu, is given by the maximum overall sets A of mu of a minus mu of a. Okay, so in the case alpha equals to one, um, they proved uh, that one can couple the two sets so that they agree with high probability. And now um, let's move on to the case alpha strictly smaller than one. So uh, in this case, it's not hard to prove that the size of the uncovered set at time alpha t cold, if you take the logarithm, Bella. yeah, Ah, sorry, sorry, sorry. To, there is a question in the chat. Ah, sorry, is, didn't see. No, no, maybe because maybe you can see, but I will read it for you. Uh, okay, yeah, to, I saw it now. What is the copy? From the, yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay, so um, so I can't describe the coupling because what they showed. Yeah, so what they showed is that the total variation distance converges to zero. So uh, if the total variation goes to zero, so. Um, an equivalent definition of total variation is to say that uh, it's the total variation distance between mu and mu is equal to the infimum over all couplings of two variables x and y, which have uh, the correct marginals mu and mu of the probability that x is not equal to y. So uh, they showed that the total variation distance goes to zero. So this gives you that there exists a coupling, but the coupling is not explicit. 
Does this answer the question? Okay, great. So now um, let me move on to the case when alpha is strictly smaller than one. So um, as I said, uh, it's not hard to prove that if you take the logarithm of the uncovered set of the size of the uncovered set at time alpha t comb, and you divide by log of n to the d, the size of the torus, then this converges to one minus alpha in probability as n goes to infinity. So what this implies is that with high probability, the uncovered set at time alpha t comb has size which is polynomial in n and it's n to the d minus alpha d plus some little of one. So now the question that uh, Roberto Oliveira asked is uh, for alpha equal to one, they were able to couple it to a Bernoulli set. So can one do the same uh, for some alpha strictly smaller than one? So the question is, is there some alpha strictly smaller than one so that the uncovered set is close to a Bernoulli set? And now the parameter of uh, each Bernoulli random variable should be one over n to the alpha d. So when alpha is equal to one, this became one over n to the d. Um, so the question is, is there an alpha so that you can couple the uncovered set at time alpha t cove to an IID Bernoulli set where every point is contained uh, with this probability, one over n to the alpha d. So um, the proof uh, that Oliver and Prata used does not work in this case because it was a combinatorial proof uh, which relied quite heavily on the fact that uh, the uncovered set when you take alpha equal to one, so the uncovered set at time t cov has size which is of order one uh, in expectation. And this was crucial for them because if you write down the definition of total variation, then, uh, so we're looking at the total variation distance between the set L of U of alpha t cov and L of the Bernoulli set, call it V. Um, so if you write down the total variation distance, you can express it as the sum over all subsets of the torus of the probability that u of alpha t cov is equal to the subset minus the probability that v is equal to the subset. Uh, and so in the case when alpha is equal to one, because the uncovered set has size of order one, one can restrict the sum to sets of size of order one. But uh, when alpha is strictly smaller than one, as I showed here, the uncovered set has polynomial size. And so then if one tries to uh, work out the combinatorics, it becomes hopeless uh, because uh, one gets exponentially many sets. So um, the, this question, whether there exists alpha strictly smaller than one, uh, was answered in a paper I wrote with Jason Miller back in 2013. So what we proved is that if <clears throat> now we have a Bernoulli family indexed by the points of the torus, Zx alpha, so that marginally each of them is Bernoulli with parameter one over n to the alpha d, and we consider the set of points of the torus which have Zx of alpha equal to one, then we showed that for all d greater than or equal to three, there exist two thresholds alpha zero of d and alpha one of d. And what is important here is that alpha one of d is strictly smaller than one, so that when alpha is above alpha one of d, then we can couple the uncovered set at time alpha t cov with this Bernoulli set v alpha, so that the two agree with probability going to one as n goes to infinity. And for alpha smaller than alpha zero of d, uh, we show that this is not possible. So the total variation distance converges to one as n goes to infinity. Okay, so, so that's um, what we proved. And let me say a few words about the threshold alpha zero of d. So alpha zero of d is the threshold for the appearance of neighbors in the uncovered set. So what do I mean by this? If we consider, let's call it W, to be the sum over all X and Y that are neighbors of the indicator that 
X and Y are in the uncovered set. So X and Y neighbors here, I mean that they are neighbors on the torus. So if we take W to be uh, the total number of points that are neighbors in the torus and are both contained in the uncovered set, then um, in when alpha is is smaller than alpha zero of d, then the uncovered set uh, u of alpha cove contains a lot more neighbors than the uniformly the than the Bernoulli set. So, uh, and the statistic that we use to differentiate them here is exactly uh, this random variable w here that counts the number of neighbors. Um, and um, okay, so uh, this is the statistic that distinguishes them, and it's not hard to show that. Uh, to obtain an exact expression for the appearance of neighbors, which is given by this expression here. So alpha zero of D is equal to one plus PD over two, where PD is the probability that a simple random walk on ZD comes back to zero uh, when it starts from zero. Um, and I want to mention also that, uh, so above alpha zero, then there are no neighbors with high probability. And not only there are no neighbors, but if you have any two points in the uncovered set, then these two points are a distance and to some gamma apart. So the uncovered set above alpha zero of D does not contain neighbors and any two points are at the polynomial distance apart. Okay, so, um, and the other, uh, I just want to emphasize that um, we were happy here that alpha one of D was strictly smaller than one, but uh, we're not happy that uh, alpha one of D was converging to one as D was going to infinity. And this was just a problem of the proof. Okay, so, so as I said, we're not happy that alpha one of D was going to one because one would expect that as dimension increases, maybe one should be able to uh, improve the threshold or at least show that it converges to something bounded away from one. And this is what uh, <clears throat> I proved um, a few years later with uh, Samuel Lesker Taylor. So we showed that there exists a threshold alpha one of D which uh, is bounded away from one. So it converges to three quarters as D goes to infinity. So that above this threshold, we can again couple the uncovered set uh, with the Bernoulli family so that they agree with high probability. Um, so uh, here it's nice that alpha one of D does not go to one, but uh, it does not match the threshold alpha zero of D. So alpha zero of D I wrote on the previous slide that it's one plus PD over two where PD is the probability that the simple random walk comes back to zero. And so as D goes to infinity, this converges to a half. So you see that these two thresholds are uh, quite far apart. But um, the advantage of uh, our theorem is that um, we gave a much simpler proof using the Chenstein method. So I'll come back to the Chenstein method a little bit later in my talk, but let me just say that uh, the Chenstein method is a technique to compare uh, a correlated uh, to compare a correlated Bernoulli family to an independent Bernoulli family. You want to compare the two distributions in total variation distance, and I'll say more about this in a little bit. Uh, so, uh, but again, I were not able to prove a phase transition. So what do I mean by this? I mean that there exists some threshold alpha star so that when alpha is above alpha star, the law of the uncovered set can be coupled with the IID Bernoulli family so that they agree with high probability and below uh, you cannot do this. So the total variation distance goes to one as n goes to infinity. So, um, for this conjecture, one wants to be able to couple the two sets so that they agree uh, with high probability. Um, and so in my recent work with Alex and Pierre-Francois that we hope to upload uh, on the archive quite soon, um, instead of uh, trying to prove phase transition for this problem, uh, instead of trying to couple the two sets so that they are equal, uh, we uh, managed to couple them up to a sprinkling parameter. So uh, as I will explain in the next theorem, um, the uncovered set 
is included in the Bernoulli family with parameter which is uh, alpha minus epsilon, and it includes a Bernoulli family with parameter alpha plus epsilon. So I will explain that here. So again, uh, the setup is the same. So we have an IID family of uh, Bernoulli's with parameter one over n to the alpha d, and we consider the set of points which have um, value equal to one. Zx of alpha is equal to one. And what we prove is that for every epsilon, we can couple the uncovered set with the two Bernoulli families, V of alpha plus epsilon and V of alpha minus epsilon, so that the set V of alpha plus epsilon is included in the uncovered set and it, in, it is included in V of alpha minus epsilon with probability tending to one as n goes to infinity. And this is if and only if alpha is larger than the threshold alpha zero of d, which was uh, the threshold for the appearance of neighbors. And below alpha zero of d, uh, this is not possible. So uh, this is our first result. So instead of trying to couple the uncovered set uh, with the Bernoulli family so that they are equal, uh, we are coupling them up to sprinkling. Yeah, Augusto. Uh, so um, if alpha is equal to alpha zero, do you have one of the inclusions? Um, both there? Um, OK, so one of the inclusions you do, but you don't have the other one. Yeah. Um, there is another question. Yeah, sorry. Um, yeah, so I'll come back to that later. I can describe it now, but here it is explicit. Yeah. Actually, OK, it's not. OK, I take it back. So I will explain later what is explicit and what is not. OK, so uh, that's the first theorem. And the second one, which I have not written uh, precisely, um, because it would take uh, too much notation. So, um, so the previous theorem works as long as alpha is above alpha zero of d. So here, as long as alpha is above a half, we have that the uncovered set at time alpha t curve is close again up to sprinkling in the same sense as before to a union of independent sets k. So um, k now, if you are between a half and the threshold alpha zero of d, then uh, you allow neighbors. So k could be, for instance, uh, neighboring points. And then you calculate what is the probability that neighboring points appear in the uncovered set and then you consider a Bernoulli family of such sets. And so um, you can couple it up to sprinkling so that it's equal to the union of all of these independent sets, each of them appearing with a correct probability. So um, these two statements that I just mentioned, I mentioned them for the uncovered set of random walk, uh, but um, the proofs are work almost exactly in the same way for the vacant set of random interlacements. And they also work for the high points of the Gaussian free field. Uh, so now I'm going to recall the definition of the Gaussian free field. And I'm going to give you an almost complete proof in the case of the Gaussian free field, uh, because uh, that's the easy case. And then I will explain uh, what one needs to do in uh, the random walk case. So let me quickly recall the definition of the GFF on the torus. So it's a central Gaussian process indexed by the vertices of the torus. So we call it phi of x. And so it's a Gaussian process with mean zero. And to fully characterize it, we need to give its covariance function. And so the covariance between phi x and phi y is equal to g of x y, where g is the green kernel for simple random walk on ZD. So remember, uh, D is greater than or equal to three. So GXY is the green kernel for simple random walk on ZD. And since the random walk is transient, this is well-defined. So it's the expected number of visits to Y when the walk starts from X and you run the walk forever. And this is a finite number by transients. Okay, so now how do we define the alpha late points? 
So <clears throat> I uh, denoted L alpha, <clears throat> and it's the set of points which have a GFA value, so for which phi of x is at least uh, this value here. So if you forget about the alpha, this uh, square root is the maximum of the GFF on the torus. And so then we are asking, uh, we are looking at the set of points which have value phi of x uh, greater than or equal uh, to this where we introduce this alpha. <clears throat> Uh, so that's the definition of the Gaussian free field. And on the next slide, I'm going to state the theorem in this case. Uh, so let me uh, just give you the definition of random interlacements, but I'm not going to talk more about that. So uh, an intuitive way of thinking of random interlacements is as a Poisson process of bi-infinite random walk trajectories. Uh, and these were introduced, this process was introduced by Stittman in 2000 in order to describe the trace left by simple random walk on uh, ZD in the transient case, and then was extended by Augusto for um, general transient graphs. And as I said, the results that I mentioned before for the uncovered set of random walk uh, work in exactly the same way for the vacant set of random interlacements. So now let me just state the result for the GFS. So again, the same setup as before, uh, we have this II de Bernoulli family, and uh, the probability that Zx alpha is equal to one is equal to the probability that X belongs to uh, the alpha late points for the GFF. Uh, so here I didn't write Bernoulli n to the minus alpha d because one also gets a log factor. Uh, but what's important is that it's an II de Bernoulli family. And again, we consider the set of points were, uh, which have value one. And again, we have the same statement as before. So uh, we can couple it up to sprinkling to this um, Bernoulli set, the alpha, so that uh, we have this inclusion with probability going to one. So um, now in the second part of my talk, if there, if there are no questions, um, yeah. So in the second part of my talk, I'm going to explain uh, the ideas behind the proofs. Uh, and as I said before, I'm going to give um, a complete proof of the Gaussian free field case. So the main tool that uh, we use is the Chenstein method. And as I said before, the Chenstein method is um, a technique uh, in order to bound the total variation distance between a correlated Bernoulli family, Zi, indexed by some set i, uh, so we want to compare the law of this to the law of an, I, of an independent Bernoulli family, which uh, has the property that Zi has the same distribution as Zi tilde for all i. So the Chenstein method gives us conditions uh, in order to say that the total variation distance between this whole family minus uh, the law of Zi tilde, we want to say that this is small. Okay, so let me explain how this works, what the conditions are. So let me, uh, for concreteness, let me just take i to be the torus, and let's take zx to be the indicator that x is in the uncovered set. So this is my correlated Bernoulli family, and my z tilde is the iid Bernoulli family, so px I'm going to denote the probability that Zx is equal to one. And this is n to the minus alpha d. And it's the same for Z tilde. So how does the Chenstein method work? So for every x in my space, I'm going to define a neighborhood of x. So we can think of it as being, let's say, a ball of a certain radius around x. And now um, we can bound the total variation distance between these two families by the sum of three quantities, b1, b2, b3, that I'm going to write now. So the first term, b1, um, gives a control on the size of the neighborhood, on, of the neighborhoods. So b1 is defined as the sum over all x in i the sum over all y 
in the neighborhood of x, px, py. So one wants um, all the three quantities that I will write b1, b2, b3 to be small. So from here, you see uh, what the right radius uh, are, is to take so that b1 is small. b2 controls short range interactions. So it's the sum over all x and i, y in bx, the probability that zx is equal to one and zy is equal to one. So this, oops, this controls short range interactions. So usually B1 and B2 are easy to handle. And the third quantity B3 is the sum over all X and I, that's the hardest term. And you take the expectation of ZX minus its expectation, but when you condition on what happens outside of the neighborhood BX. So this controls long range interactions. So for every X you define here, we just took a ball, it doesn't have to be a ball. They don't even have to be the same for every vertex. You can define them in any way you like. So you have X and then you want uh, to understand how ZX, so the value here is correlated with respect to what happens outside of this ball. And the total variation distance between the family Z and the family Z tilde is upper bounded by B1 plus B2 plus B3. This is what the Chinstein method says. And so in order to show that the total variation distance is small, we need to show that these three terms are small. So in my work with Sam, uh, we, it was easy to control B1 and B2 when uh, alpha is above alpha zero of D. So uh, let me just write uh, for B1. Uh, so remember, I said before that above alpha zero of T, we have polynomial separation. So we actually have this separation between any points of the uncovered set with high probability. So if we take this as our radius, then B1 is the sum of all points in the torus, which is n to the D, then all points in the ball, which is n to the two alpha minus one minus delta times d, and then the probability that x is uncovered, which is n to the minus alpha d, and that y is uncovered, which is n to the minus alpha d. So all of these gives you n to the minus delta d. So this is small. And then um, one can also easily control the term b2. And uh, the term b2 is also small. But uh, the main difficulty here was to control long range interactions. In other words, uh, to control uh, the term B3. And this is where uh, the threshold um, alpha one of D came from. So um, for B1 and B2, it's enough for alpha to be alpha uh, above alpha zero of D, but then for B3 to be small, we had to take alpha larger than another threshold, which I said converges to three quarters. Okay. So what is the new idea here in uh, my work with Alexi and uh, Pierre-Francois? So the first step is, um, so our problem is to control long range interactions. So the first step is to couple our process, whenever I say couple, I mean up to sprinkling, to a short range process. So what do I mean by short range? I mean that if you know what happens inside of a ball and you take say some radius R uh, from this ball, then what happens inside the ball is independent of what happens outside the ball. This is what I mean by short range. So short range, uh, needs we need to uh, specify the parameters. So it has range R if what happens in here is independent of what happens outside here. That's what we mean uh, by short range. So the first step, is to couple our process to a short range process. And then uh, we want to apply the Chenstein method to the short range process 
for which we know by definition, because it's short range, if we choose the radius of the neighborhoods appropriately, then we're going to get the P3 is equal to zero because we have eliminated long range interactions. Okay, so that's the idea. And now I'm going to explain uh, how we can apply this uh, to the GFF case, which is um, a very simple proof. So um, I recall here the definition of the GFF. And so the first step, uh, the coupling, in the case of the GFF, it comes to us for free from the special Markov property. So let me recall it. So what the special Markov property says is that if you have a ball B and you know the values of the field on, sorry, if you know the values of the field on the boundary of the ball, then the values of the field inside and outside are independent. That's what the special Markov property says. So conditional on the values of the field on the boundary of B, the values of the field inside are independent of the values of the field inside. And we can write this more precisely. So if we take H to be equal to phi on the outside of the ball, and we take it inside of the ball, we take it to be the discrete harmonic function, which agrees with phi on the boundary of the ball. Then if we take C of X, to be phi of x minus the harmonic extension, then this is a Gaussian free field on the, in the ball, which has zero boundary condition. And what is important is that it's independent of the Gaussian free field outside. And moreover, uh, the, Gaussian free uh, the Gaussian free field C of x is measurable with respect to the field on the ball. And here I should have written together with the boundary of the ball. So uh, this measurability uh, will become important in the next slide. But for now, um, what uh, I want to emphasize is that, so what I said before that uh, given the values on the boundary, uh, the field inside is independent of the field outside. So we can express phi of x inside as an independent field plus the harmonic extension of the boundary values. Okay, so uh, now how does this give us the, um, the coupling to the, to the short range process? So let's take a partition of our space into boxes of side length R. So let's call them BI. <clears throat> and now for every box BI, I'm going to consider the field uh, C with superscript BI to be at the point X, it takes the value of phi of X minus the harmonic extension of the boundary values of phi on this box here. So for every box, I define its corresponding uh, C as before. And now if we take the flip C, which for every point, I look, uh, I find the box in which it's contained and I take uh, the corresponding uh, C then this is now a field which has range uh, to R. So why is this? Why does C have range um, to R? So we said, so let me just, let's suppose we're looking at this box here. Then we know that um, C of this box uh, is a measurable function. So C of BI is sigma of phi of x, x in bi, and the boundary of bi measurable. And it's also independent of what happens outside over here. And so um, if you take now another box over here, then uh, bj, then uh, C over here is going to be a measurable function of phi for the corresponding box. And since phi he uh, C here is independent of everything that happens outside, then it's going to be independent of C inside the other box. And in general, inside everything, which is just take distance to R to be safe. So um, we started from our field phi and we obtained so phi has long range correlations, but from phi we defined a new field C, which has um, 
which is uh, has range 2R. So if you go to distance 2R, then what happens inside and outside uh, is independent. And um, okay, so now, um, how do we couple phi and psi up to sprinkling? So phi and psi here differ, oops, differ by this function h. So if h is small, then uh, phi and psi are going to be close to each other. And so when we want, remember we are interested in coupling the, the late points, the alpha late points of phi to the alpha late points of psi. And so if h is small, then we can um, perturb the definition of alpha late points for phi by taking slightly smaller value for psi or slightly larger, depending on what direction uh, we want to take. So uh, the epsilon that we take comes from the error here from the h. OK, so now we have coupled them so that they are close. And so in this way, we can couple uh, the high points so that uh, you have, we have the inclusion as uh, in the statements earlier. And now C is, um, uh, Psi has short range. So we can apply the Chenstein method to C and get that B3 is zero. So then we can couple C to an IID Bernoulli family. And then we can pass this back onto phi uh, from uh, this coupling here and the sprinkling, we get it from here. So let me just go back to the question from before if the coupling is explicit. So um, the coupling here is explicit. It's given uh, from uh, this decomposition of the GFF, but then the coupling of psi here to the IID field of the IID Bernoulli field, this is not explicit because it just comes from controlling the total variation distance. Okay. So uh, this is an almost complete proof for the Gaussian free field case. And now um, what, uh, now we would like to do the same thing for the random walk. So um, the difficulty is that now we no longer have the special Markov property. So that's what, um, that's the first step that we need um, to do for the random walk. And uh, this is our next theorem. So X is a simple random walk on ZD on the torus. Um, we prove that there exists a coupling between X and a process X tilde of range at most R in the same way as before I define a uh, short range. So if you look at the set of points that the process uh, covers here, and then you take distance R from here, then this is independent of what happens outside. So there exists a coupling between X and the short range process X tilde, so that uh, for every epsilon, if we look at the range of the walk up to time n to the D, then uh, this is included in the range of X tilde up to a slightly larger time, one plus epsilon n to the D, and, slightly, and it includes the range up to a slightly smaller time, one minus epsilon uh, times n to the D. And the probability that this succeeds is at least one minus some polynomial in N and R times exponential of minus epsilon R to the D minus two over two. I put this exact expression here so that you can see what values of R uh, one can consider in order to decouple. Okay, so <clears throat> this uh, replaces the special Markov property of the GFF. And so now, since we obtained a short range process X tilde, we can apply the Chenstein method to X tilde and get that uh, B3 is equal to zero. And so uh, we can uh, apply Chenstein, couple it to an IAD Bernoulli family, and then pass this back to X uh, from here. <clears throat> okay, so uh, the coupling, the random walk and the random interlacements range uh, has been uh, done previously. And let me mention uh, some important works by Snitman <clears throat> and by Sergei Popov and Augusto. So the usual setup here is that you have two sets A and B that are separated by some distance. And then you're interested in the range of the walk intersected with A and the range of the walk intersected with B or the vacant set of random interlacements intersect or the random interlacements process intersect with A and intersected with B. And then you want to decouple these 
up to a sprinkling parameter. So a very powerful method, which was introduced by Sergei and Augusto, uh, which is called soft local times, can be used uh, to decouple up to sprinkling the range in these joint sets that are separated. And then um, the probability that the coupling succeeds is given in terms of uh, the distance uh, between these two sets. So this is a very powerful technique uh, that has been used in a lot. So this paper has been very influential and has been used in a lot of other works on uh, random interlacements and the GFA. So um, now I'm going to state a, theory, a general proposition that we prove, which is very similar in spirit to soft local times. And on the next slide, I'm going to explain uh, what the main difference is. So here we have a general Markov chain ZI, which has transition matrix P. And we have another transition matrix P tilde. And we have two collections of IID exponential one random variables, Xi and Xi tilde. Then <clears throat> there exists a Markov chain ZI tilde, which has transition matrix P tilde. So that if we define these quantities, GK and GK tilde, so this is what uh, Sergei and Augusto call the soft local time. Um, so this is defined GK of Z as the sum of the exponentials times the probability to go from ZI to Z and analogously for the tilde process. So if you were to take expectation here, then you would get just the local time of Z. So you would uh, get rid of the exponentials because they have mean one. So it's a bit like the local time, but you also multiply by, Z, by XCI. Uh, so this is why they call it the soft local time. And what is the important property is that if G, the soft local time of the chain Z at time K, if this is upper bounded by the soft local time of the chain Z tilde up to time M, and this upper bounded by GN of Z, then this gives a comparison of the ranges of uh, these two processes. So the range of Z up to time K is included in the range of Z tilde up to M, and this is included in the range of Z up to time M. So uh, this is very similar to soft local times, uh, but um, so let me just say um, uh, what the, the main idea behind soft local times is. So you start with a Poisson process of the right intensity, and then uh, you construct two Markov chains with given transition matrices on the same space using this Poisson process. So um, doing something like this has been done previously, but uh, I think the new insight here is to use the soft local time in order to be able to compare the ranges uh, between the two processes. So let me just go back here for a second. So uh, I just want to say that if P and P tilde are closed, then if we want to understand to know what is the probability of this inclusion, and suppose we know that P and P tilde, these two matrices are close to each other, then we need to understand what the probability of this event here happening. Then if P and P tilde say were the same, then it would just boil down to asking about whether a sequence of IID exponentials is concentrated or not. So this gives you a very nice way of controlling ranges by just controlling um, sums of exponentials. Um, so, um, okay, so soft local times works in the way I described. So you start with a Poisson point process, you construct two Markov chains using this process, and then comparing the soft local times of these processes gives you a comparison of the two ranges. Now, the important difference with uh, the proposition that I said before is that in soft local times, you don't couple your original Markov chain, but you couple a copy of the original Markov chain. So you couple a Markov chain with the correct transition matrix, but not the original Markov chain. But what we do here is that we couple the original Markov chain uh, with a new Markov chain, uh, Z tilde. And uh, let me just uh, say, uh, I'll just speak for one more minute. Uh, I just want to say why this is important for us. So if you have oops, two annuli that are separated, then with soft local times, so in um, when one wants to study the uncovered set, 
one usually considers excursions of the walk across Anilai, as in the picture here. So in soft local times, what one does is that you start with your Poisson process, and then you couple your excursions here and here with uh, independent excursions up to some sprinkling. But um, so you can decorrelate uh, what happens in this box with what happens in this box up to some sprinkling. Uh, but uh, what we want to do here is we want it to couple our process with a short range process everywhere, not just for two boxes. So uh, one could use soft local times uh, to decouple boxes that are separated, even more than two, but then it's not clear how to put them all together uh, to couple the whole chain. While in our case, we start with our original walk, which gives rise uh, to um, a certain number of excursions, and then we couple the given excursions with independent excursions uh, for every box. And I'll stop here. I'll mute myself. Thank you, Perla. Are there any more questions uh, or comments for Perla? I have more questions. Let's see. So, yes, Augusta. <laughs> so if you go back to the K sets, the K independent sets you mentioned uh, between a half and yeah. alpha zero. Right. Uh, these sets have uh, only uh, isolated points in pairs of neighbors, or they okay. are richer? Yeah, that's a good question. So um, they, so we have a condition on the capacity of the of the sets. So the capacity of K has to be at most, um, I think, two over G of zero, um, the green kernel of zero. So, um, so actually, you could uh, have more than two points. Because yes, if yes. you have points that are far away, then they attain almost the two over G of zero. But uh, you could have also, um, so actually, we did some calculations using uh, some numerical values for, um, for the capacity and, and, sorry, and for the green kernel. And uh, we get, I mean, sorry, numerical values for the green kernel. And we get that um, you could, so we tried for certain types of sets. So like you could have a set like this and uh, you could also have more points. So depending on dimension, um, what you can allow changes, but we have a condition on the capacity and the diameter of the sets are at most um, logarithmic or some power of log. And is one half expected to be a special value there, like a phase transition okay. occurring as well? Yeah, so that's a good point. Uh, so we haven't been able to prove it yet below one half, but um, we think that uh, it should be similar below a half. So, I mean, one would allow different collections of sets. So I guess also back uh, with Jason, we had the conjecture that below alpha zero of D, the uncovered set should look like a Bernoulli set, which is decorated. All the way up to zero, any positive alpha. Yeah, just the decorations would change. I don't know because we can't prove it, but I think maybe that would be. Nice. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any more uh, questions or comments? Okay, so if not, let's thanks. Let's thank Perla again. Thank you so much. And we update um, next Wednesday at the same time and the same place. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Perla. Thank you. Nice to see you. Bye. Bye.